Merry Christmas. We'd like to welcome everyone. We especially welcome those of you who may be visiting this morning. Very good to have you with us. Inside our bulletins, there uh, probably should be a connection card. We'd ask you to fill that out if you could. It's appreciated, uh, both members and guests, and especially we're looking for new phone numbers and uh, email addresses and the like. So please take a look at that during the course of the service. Uh, this service, which we'll be using, a service of uh, readings and carols, was first uh, performed at Christ College in Cambridge, England. And uh, we're thankful to be able to uh, adapt that service for our purposes. We're going to begin now with the first hymn, Now Sing We Now Rejoice. May the Lord bless our Christmas worship today. We rise for the invocation. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. A Savior has been born to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. The Lord has made his salvation known. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Make music to the Lord with the harp. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Sing to the Lord a new song. We pray. O God, with gladness, we celebrate the yearly festival of the birth of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we have been set free from the bondage of sin, death, and the devil. Grant that we who joyfully receive him as our Redeemer may with true confidence behold him when he comes again not as a humble baby born in a stable, but as the King of kings and Lord of lords. In his name we pray. Amen. Oh, where shall joy be far gone?
You may be seated. Why are we celebrating Jesus' birthday? Is it because that's not what we do? Well, we're going to go back to Scripture. We're going to listen to what God's Word has to say as the reason why we celebrate this day. And it all started in the beginning. We're going to read from the account of Genesis where God reminds us as to why he sent a Savior into this world. And he reminds us so beautifully because we have a problem. Because of Adam and Eve, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in turn, he writes in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now understand, God could have very easily destroyed them. Sent them to hell. Eat of that tree, you will die. But in love, he turned to Adam and Eve, talking to Satan, and made this first gospel promise. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. God's word.
That first promise was announced and retold by prophets for thousands of years. Yes, by prophets pointing to the babe Jesus, the Messiah, who was also the prophet. And in our first lesson, we are encouraged to listen to him, not just to hear him. Your parents didn't want you just to hear them. They wanted you to listen to them. Listen to a baby? What can a baby tell me? Well, he grows up to be a wonderful counselor, that wonderful counselor who listens to you, that mighty God who, yes, could scare you to death but allows you to hold him like a baby today. That everlasting Father, that perfect, kind, loving Father, he acts like that too. And he's the Prince of Peace who's come to give you everlasting peace. Did you hear that? Probably better said, are you listening? Listen now to Deuteronomy 18 and Isaiah 9. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That was the word of the Lord. As the centuries passed, many began to doubt that promise that God had made of a Savior for his people. Many more people abandoned their faith altogether. Even most of Israel's kings became faithless to God too. And so God chastened them for their unbelief, intending to draw them back to him. He raised up these powerful empires who destroyed eventually their nation and, and carried the few survivors off into captivity. And yet in mercy, 
God allowed a small remnant of his people to return once again. Still, they found themselves ruled by oppressive governments, by the Persians, followed by the Greeks, and then finally by Rome. And at that point, it seemed that David's royal line was dead. But God gave his people something for their faith to hold on to, and and he promised a miraculous birth. A woman who descended from David would give birth to a boy. And that boy that, that she would bear would be none other than God's own son. And God even foretold the exact location of where that child would be born. He foretold it 700 years in advance of how that birth would take place in some humble, unremarkable, ignored village. Let's listen to the words of our God, the prophecies that were given to his people, first of all, from Isaiah chapter 7, where it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then from Micah chapter 5. Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against it. They will strike Israel's ruler on a cheek with a rod. But you... Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient time. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. The word of our Lord. In my country, Pakistan, where the church is a very suffering church and persecuted church, but at the same time, many people in Pakistan who don't know who is he, still many know 
about him as the Savior is born and he is Christ the Lord. Many years back, there was a man there who was not Christian, who was a Muslim, and he started believing in Christ. What happened with him that he was sentenced to death? So while he was going to be hanged there, the pastor was there in our area, and he said, I would, so the pastor went on his bicycle there, and he told him that I am here to pray for him, to pray for you. And he said, Pastor, I don't need any prayer right now. In about five minutes, I will be with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you have any message to give him, please let me know. And that's many people in Pakistan also baptize themselves, just pouring water on them because due to persecution, many baptism cannot occur there. Anyhow, we see here again the John the Baptist who is preparing the way for Jesus Christ and maybe he had the same, he traveled the same journey of faith. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord make straight paths for him. John clothes were made of camel and hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was loctus and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Amen. to get just a little glimpse of how God fulfills his promises. Throughout the whole Testament, people were listening to everything that the prophets said, remembering that one day a son of Adam and Eve would come that would die but would live to save us. And then to be that woman, that virgin, who was not married, and the angel would come to her and give her a promise. How would you have reacted 
More importantly, how did Mary react? Listen to these words from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, and then listen to her song that follows. The Magnificat, as Mary praises the Lord for the gift of her Savior and ours. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. God's word. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servant. One day, a carpenter named Joseph closed up his shop for a time because he had to travel to Bethlehem for a census. For some odd reason, he took his pregnant wife along. Not sure why. Not sure why Mary decided to go on an 80 or so mile trip 
so far along in her pregnancy, but she went. And then they finally got there, only to find no vacancy signs all over town. Come on, Joseph. Didn't you know other people had to go to Bethlehem at that time? And really, your wife is pregnant. Perhaps the stress and the tension of the moment pushed her into labor. And to give birth in a barn? Moms, the birth of a child is supposed to be memorable, but not this kind of memorable. What about hygiene, cleanliness, light, cutting the umbilical cord? So many details are not given to us. They don't matter. The Roman world was turned upside down because God made a promise. Mary and Joseph's life was turned upside down at this time because God made a promise. and He was going to make sure he kept it. And he did. And that's why the account is so simple and so meaningful. All the fluff is out. Just the birth of Jesus is included. That's all we want to hear. Makes it so memorable, so memorized even. Luke 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. The word of the Lord. There are many times when I read my Bible and uh, yeah, I'm looking at an account and I say to myself, why would God do it that way? And this is one of those accounts. God's son is born. And so God is determined that he is going to announce this message, that 
his son is born. He uses an angel. That I get, right? And, and it's all in the middle of the night. All of a sudden, there's this surreal heavenly light. There's an angel. The angel announces it. Then suddenly, after that, there's this whole heavenly host. And they're all praising God. Understand that. That makes sense. But he gives the message to shepherds. Now, we've got this romantic view of shepherds. Let me tell you that if you lived at that time, you would not have liked shepherds. They were uncouth. They lived in fields. They smelled like their sheep. They were there for days, weeks at a time, without an ability to even bathe themselves. And then you got some guys who are shepherds, and they're just with each other. You can imagine the type of language that they used with one another. And so those good church-going people of the day did not respect shepherds nor did the religious leaders. Because the religious leaders, they looked down their nose at shepherds since shepherds were constantly becoming ceremonially unclean. And because of the nature of their job, they couldn't get to the temple regularly, if at all, to go through the Jewish ritual. And God chose them. He did not choose people like you. Or me. He chose shepherds to be the first recipient of the good news of the birth of his son. People who outwardly look like they didn't deserve that salvation. And that gives us hope and comfort and joy. Because if God reaches out to the most lowly and worst sinners, then his salvation meant for them is meant for me too. Let's rejoice in, in the account of the angels appearing to the shepherds with the good news from Luke chapter 2. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The word of the Lord.
in my country, the shepherds are the least respected. And they are the poorest of the poor too. Many of the shepherds, when they are moving out, they have been run up by the cars and the big tractors. And sometimes they are so much injured that they have been brought to the hospital. When I was there as a general surgeon, I met a lot of shepherds. Some of them were just died on the spot, and some were very, very badly hurt. At the same time, I see that God's word for the shepherd was a great honor for them and a great news for them. And that's why when they saw these angels, they started going to meet Christ. In Luke chapter 2, verse 15 to 20, it is written, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherd returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Amen. We rise for prayer. Precious Savior, we rejoice at your birth because we know that you came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. 
We look beyond the manger to the cross where your precious blood was shed to cover our sins from God's sight forever. Bless our faith this day as we stand in awe before your manger bed, contemplating the mystery of your incarnation. And again as we bow our heads in humble contrition, confessing our sins before your cross. May we never lose sight of the cross as the purpose for your coming. As we reach out our hearts to you in loving adoration and in penitence and trust, forgive us our sins. Make us alive with hope, settle us with your peace, and renew in us the joy of everlasting life. And finally, dear Jesus, give to us your blessings in this coming year as you see fit. Satisfy our needs as you are wont to do. As we watch for your glorious return, may we do so with confidence and with joy as people who have become true children of the Father through faith in his Son. Listen and hear our prayers, which we offer to our Heavenly Father in your name, and be always ready to intercede with him in our behalf. We adore you. We worship and serve you, our Savior and King. And now we join together in praying as Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Again, Merry Christmas to everyone. We're so glad that you could uh, join us today for worship. Very glad to have you here. Uh, We'd like to reinforce that tomorrow is Sunday. Sort of strange to think that way, but it is Sunday, and uh, we'll have services at 8 and 1030. 
If you have uh, offerings or if you have a guest card that you'd like to drop off, look for one of the boxes in the gathering area. If you're traveling today, we wish you very safe travel and uh, a wonderful celebration with your family and friends on this uh, Christmas 2021. God bless you all. Thank you.